Um, all right, now I'll go ahead and get started. Uh, and so welcome back everybody to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Uh, and uh, tonight we're going to be continuing our look at a particular sutra about Manjushri's Pure Land. But I want to tell you what the theme is tonight, if you haven't seen it already somewhere else. So the theme for tonight's Dharma Doors is the question, why is the Buddha smiling? So this is sort of, you know, you don't, you see it every now and then, this idea or this concept that the Buddha is always kind of smiling a little bit. And there's a few things that I want to say about that. It actually pertains directly to the sutra, at least where we're at. But this new format of the Dharma doors, you know, it's thematic. And so I want to kind of really focus tonight on that idea of the Buddha smile. And I kind of have, I suppose, a few opening remarks, so to speak, about the topic, but I'd love to hear from anybody, if anybody has ideas about the Buddha's smile. Um, but basically, I kind of have two, um, two ideas that I kind of want to just throw out there. Not even ideas, I guess they'd almost be an anecdotes in a way. Um, and then we'll sort of segue back to our sutra, because again, the, the sutra is explicitly talking about this event of the Buddha smiling. And actually where we left off, the question was raised, oh, why is the Buddha smiling? So I guess on that note, I'll have, I'll have three things to say about why, why, the, why is the Buddha smiling? I'll, ultimately, I think I have three things to say, but um, so yeah, let's start with just the anecdotal thing about the Buddha smile, sort of just a personal story from my practice, my life in that way. Funny story. So I had been meditating for a while, I would say a few years, I guess, four or five years of having really developed a meditation practice in that way. So I had kind of gotten over I would say some hurdles as far as being able to sit still, right? And being comfortable with that. I had gotten over the hurdles of boredom and things like that and was really, you know, learning to meditate. And I was in a monastery, but it was a funny situation where it was, it is a monastery. Um, it's in upstate New York, uh, but it was a, it's a, at the time, it was a vacant, dormant uh, monastery. Uh, so all the monastics had left, and I actually got invited up there by uh, the caretaker. So the caretaker was sort of a quasi-monastic. He was a lay person, but during the winter, he would basically take vows and be a, a, a monk in that way. But he was sort of the, you know, the caretaker of the monastery literally keeping the boilers running to keep the whole place, you know, from uh, freezing and all of that. And I went up to visit him. Great opportunity, by the way, to just hang out in an empty monastery with a good friend of yours and, you know, talk, talk Dharma. So we decided to do a meditation uh, long session. And I'll never forget it because this is the lesson that he taught me in that session. And it was really brilliant because he was walking me through this meditation and, you know, a lot about po proper posture, proper breathing, all of these things. And, you know, it was one of those situations where I was literally sitting there very stiff, watching my breathing. And then he said the thing, which was, and I can't, I just all day I've tried to remember what exactly did he say? And I can't remember what exactly he said. But it was to the effect that he said, oh, and the most important <laughs> aspect of this, don't forget to smile. And at that very moment, it brought a smile to my face and it dramatically changed that particular meditation. And I've never been, I've never meditated the same since. 
because it really jogs something out of me of taking it very seriously and not enjoying it. <laughs> like literally kind of really a stoic form of meditation. And so Jacob, I appreciate that lesson very much. Um, and so that's sort of one aspect of why is the Buddha smiling? And so again, or not again, I'll say it. If you haven't noticed images and statues and pictures of the Buddha, they will almost invariably depict the Buddha slightly smiling, not some big ear to ear grin, not teeth, but a, a pleasant smile. And the question is, why is the Buddha smiling, right? Well, one way of understanding that image and the message of the Buddha smiling is it could be a message to us to remember to smile, um, right? And so that's sort of just the first. Again, it's kind of more of an anecdote about why the Buddha smiles as a reminder. Um, and well, yeah, I won't get too, but I, I was going to get into iconography and the smile and all of that, but I don't really think we need to get too deep into the actual history of the iconography of the Buddha smiling in that way. But what I basically wanted to say was you can look at these images of the Buddha smiling and you can interpret them sort of, I would say, and even, you know, art historians would suggest this that you can look at a Buddha image as either prescriptive or descriptive. The idea being it's either prescriptive, meaning it's a suggestion for, it's a prescription, <laughs> you should do this. And so viewing images as prescriptive or descriptive, that actually that image is describing something. As good Buddhists, I don't think we should come down too hard on either side of those ideas. In fact, it's probably both prescriptive and descriptive in a certain sense. But what's, what is it descriptive of? So that sort of segues me to my next set of little ideas about the Buddha smiling. I want to mention a bunch of different words, not a bunch, but a handful of different Buddhist words that are <clears throat> really, really important to the practice. And I want to, I've actually didn't, I've never thought about actually compiling this list of terms and even thinking about this as a theme. So I'm really enjoying the, the Dharma doors for this opportunity to talk about this. But so there's all these different ideas in, in, in Buddhism. And some of the terms that I want to talk about are, well, terms like ananda, uh, joy or uh, pl pleasantness, so ananda, sukha, bliss, piti or priti, rapture, uh, abhirati is another type of delight, and mudita and pramudita. So mudita, which literally means sweetness, but you would know it as sort of empathic joy the joy for others. So those are a bunch of different ideas that I want to talk about sort of as a whole. And they all have to do with joy, happiness, delight, rapture, and bliss. So that could be one of the reasons why the Buddha is smiling, <laughs> because he is in rapture, in bliss, in joy, delight, and all of those things. But let's talk a little bit more about that. And by, and again, this is all going to get us back to the sutra. But so one of, let's deal with uh, pity or pretty as it's called, uh, uh, rapture, which is the normal translation. Let me talk about that one, ananda, kind of uh, also joy, a kind of a delight in that sense. And then sukha, sukha bliss. Let's just talk about those because those are all terms that you would ref use in, in the Buddhist world that to describe different meditative states, particularly what are called uh, dhyanas or jhanic states. And, you know, 
if you're familiar with uh, jhanic meditation or dhyana as it's called in, in Sanskrit, then you're familiar with these terms. You're familiar with these ideas and I hope you are familiar with the experience of them. But the idea is, is that I guess what I wanna say from it kind of to pr uh, frame all of this, when you start studying the Dharma and you start learning about these ideas about sort of like, um, well, like a Sangha, for example, relinquishment or non-attachment, right? That's a Sangha, non-attachment, equanimity. And you could start to get the idea that the practice of Buddhism makes one very bland or very, you know, just sort of neutral in a kind of a way. And my feeling about Buddhism, all the forms of Buddhism, is that my understanding of it is actually the, the, the Buddha would, would all really like us to be having a much better time than we're having in that way. Like that's the idea of dukkha. So dukkha, the, the suffering, that's the, yeah, it's all dukkha. And the Buddha would like to lift us out of the dukkha, but not to some blandville of neutrality. It's actually to a higher, higher <laughs> kind of joy, a higher kind of bliss. And so just to put it kind of very simply, no matter what kind of Buddhism you're talking about, whether it's kind of the more hardcore monastic form or early kind of Hinayana or Mahayana, Vajrayana, a kind of a, a commonality of all of those, again, going all the way back to the original teachings, it's about how not just human beings, by the way, how all sentient beings are pleasure seekers and pain avoiders. Kind of like that's the way that this system is kind of designed is to sort of seek pleasure and avoid displeasure. And by doing that, we self-preserve. Great, awesome. We probably wouldn't be here without that <laughs> tendency to avoid those things and to move towards those things. Yes. But the idea here is, is that while we may be programmed to do that, something's going on in the process. And what that is, is that we are learning, conditioning ourselves to derive joy and pleasure and delight from things, from stuff, from ownership of stuff, from watching things, from to listening to things and smelling things and eating things and touching things and being touched and even thinking about things. All this sort of the, the derivation, the deriving of pleasure from things. And that is, again, a byproduct of the default mode of the human being. And so what has happened is a process, and actually, it's maybe that we it didn't ever have this. It's not that we've lost this, but because we are conditioned to only derive pleasure from things, we don't know about a much higher bliss, joy, pleasure, and delight. And it's actually the joy of independence, like the joy of not needing things, the, the joy of not actually depending on those things. And you know, the idea is, of course, and this is classic Four Noble Truths, none of this should be news to anybody here tonight, but the idea is, here's the tricky, funny thing about the Four Noble Truths that you, you may not, not have ever caught or thought of. This happened to me recently. I'll give you a real world example. I love coffee. 
I love, I, I do. I love, I drink coffee all day. I, I would drink coffee all day. I would love it. So I get a tremendous amount of joy and pleasure and delight from coffee. Here's the problem. The other day I woke up and there was no coffee in the house. <gasps> ah, it was not a good morning. It was not a good morning. And sure, there was plenty of tea in the morning. Yeah, there was all that. But I derive my joy and pleasure in the morning from coffee. And so the funny thing that the Buddha taught me that I forgot that morning was that the same thing that we get pleasure from, that thing can become our worst nightmare when we're without it. And that's the lesson I got the other morning where I where confronted my dependency on my joy for coffee head on in that way. So that's sort of what we're up against is a default mode tendency to derive joy from getting things. But then the problem with that is we lose them. And what we may not know how to do is actually derive joy and pleasure from not needing things. And then that actually you know, basically from the Buddhist point of view, puts one in a permanent mode of joy, because again, it's not dependent. And so it won't, it won't fluctuate in that way. That's what we're kind of offering here, or that's what the Dharma is offering in that way. And so experiences of that come through that kind of sensory withdrawal, that sati or the mindfulness, which is about training the body, not just the mind, of course, but training the whole system. Well, first of all, like I mentioned in my opening remarks, my meditation journey, the first hurdle was training this thing to sit still. Like literally that was the first probably year or so it was just training this to be able to sit still. The joy, the rapture, the bliss was nowhere in sight. But then the idea is, is I had learned that, got the lesson from Jacob about remembering to smile. And the idea was, is that as I did that more and got better at being able to sit still, that started to be pleasurable. And then, of course, I have had those kind of moments of pretty or pretty, that kind of really rapturous or joyful feelings at moments, at times. Most of the time, I'd say my meditations are rather kind of are just a respite from the world in that sense and kind of maintenance. I don't really go to the meditation for the bliss and the rapture, but it is sort of there in that way. So, so another reason why in a descriptive mode, another reason why the Buddha it, or Buddha statues are smiling is potentially to remind us that that state of being is a joyful one <laughs> and remind, oh yeah, there's joy to be had there too in that way. Okay, so that's a few terms. Um, I do wanna mention, of course, uh, a couple more. Let's start with, well, actually, let me deal with this one. So I wanted to also mention mudita, and along with that, a term you may not know, which is pra-mudita. So mudita is, again, it's a word that literally means sweetness, but it's a particular word that the Buddhists, the Buddhists use to describe, well, a type of joy, and it's usually translated as empathic joy, because it's sort of this joy that arises from the successes of others. <laughs> it's, it's described as like the joy a parent would have for the success of their child. And like, even though they didn't, the, meaning the parent, even though they didn't uh, win the spelling bee or whatever, the parent is like really stoked for the kid and the kid's accomplishments. That's a type of mudita and in the Buddhist tradition, what's nice is that it's a practice to sort of be stoked for everybody. 
<laughs> sort of like to be, and I guess the exact opposite of this in today's language would be being a hater. I think they call it being a hater is <laughs> just actually not being stoked about people's accomplishments, but actually being kind of bitter, resentful and being a hater. Bodhisattvas and actually just Dharma practitioners in that sense, practice mudita, not being a hater, being encouraging. And again, it's not even about encouraging others. This could be a practice you could literally do on Instagram. And, and as you're strolling through the things and you see so you could be happy for somebody's fancy car, happy, for, you know, and I don't mean jealous of it, Good for them that they got their new fancy car. Good for them that they have such a big house. <laughs> but the idea again is rather than being jealous, bitter. Good for them they have such a big cock. <laughs> or that. <laughs> Randy, bro, I don't know um, where Zach's coming from. Um, so sorry about that, all folks. Um, somebody's happy about about that. Um, okay, so that's another thing about the practice is being stoked for somebody like Randy being able to say what's on his mind in that way. But the idea again is about extending that to others. And that's a practice that you'll find, you might know it as one of the four immeasurable states of mind, also known as one of the four Brahma Viharas. And those are these practices of extending loving kindness, metta, and then followed by karuna, compassion, then our mudita, this empathic joy for everybody's successes, and then upeksha or equanimity. And those are called immeasurable states of mind when they are being extended to all sentient beings in that way. And then there's an even higher form of that that's actually called pra-mudita. And that's a kind of an even just more exalted form of mudita or this um, loving, this uh, empathic joy. Okay, so those are sort of ideas. Last two words I want to mention that have to do with joy and happiness are abhirati. This is a term that's going to pop up in our sutra here, so I just wanted to mention it. So you might, if, if you're study Dharma, you probably know this word, A-B-H-I, Abhi. It's a prefix that means transcendent, way like above. And then Rati, the root word of Rati is actually Ram. Ram, which actually kind of means sort of a well, it's like playfulness and delight and, and kind of a more playful joy is a Ram. And so this is Abhiram or Abhirati. And so this is an interesting one. The idea of this one is, is it's associated with this idea. So imagine, let's go back to my coffee example. So I, I put that out there. So the joy the joy that I received from so the joy oh, a lot of uh, folks in the okay so apologies about that folks so back to my coffee example oh nigga for once shit the fuck <laughs> Okay. Everybody's coming in the room tonight. Okay. They came for the joy. All right. So I was talking about coffee a second ago and this joy that I get from drinking coffee, right? An interesting thing to do or to contemplate or to notice is this. So, and this out will have to do with abhirati. So can you, whatever, whatever your delight is, whatever your joy is, so put, take the, it's like, here's the, the, whatever it is, 
And then there's the, we could call it a vedana. We could call it like a sensation, this, this positive reaction to whatever it is. And notice whatever the joy is, notice the joy. Pay attention to the joy. And the idea is, is to begin to, in a way, separate the object, like the cup for me, my coffee, whatever it is for you. And then the feeling, like the feeling of being joyful, the feeling of, of being Are you going happy. to send me back my money? Wow. Can you send me back my money? Okay. So what I was getting at is if you can begin to pay attention to the joy, there is, is a- Is this nigga serious? I am serious. I'm really trying to teach this class. Um, <laughs> okay. So <laughs> what I want to say is, is that it's possible to actually notice just the joy and begin to develop the production and manifestation of just that joy. The idea being that abhirati is this abhi, abhi joy, abhirati, abhiram. And it's sort of about this sort of basically an ability to make oneself joyful or happy, kind of on demand in a way, because you, it's almost like a sense memory in that way, where you sink so deeply into the sense memory while you're having it, drinking coffee or doing whatever, that then you can bring back up just the joy without the thing anymore. And the development of that can lead to this kind of abhirati or this, a kind of, it's a, another kind of joy. And again, it's about this sort of ability to generate it oneself in that way. Okay. So without any further ado, one last word that you definitely know, I mentioned it a few times ago, and that's of course, ananda, classic Buddhist term for delight or pleasure, pleasing things, that's ananda. And it's funny, so actually before I jump, jump back into the sutra to segue to the heart of tonight, any questions or comments or ideas about the smile? They got some smiles to share, anything? But feeling good about where we're at? Okay, so I think you'll like this. I think you'll like this next idea about the smile. So um, yeah, in order to do this, I need to catch you back up. I need to catch us all back up. So we are reading this uh, Manjushri Bodhisattva's Pure Land Sutra. It's also known as the, and I wanted to mention this. So it's also called Man, the Manjushri's the array of virtues of Manjushri's pure land, the array of virtues, this sort of arrangement of virtues. That's what this sutra is about. The arrangement of virtues of Bodhisattva's Buddha lands. All right. So I wanted to mention that because last week we were introduced to a bodhisattva in the sutra. Bodhisattva, destroyer of vice, destroyer of the non-virtuous. And the householder, he was a householder bodhisattva named uh, destroyer of vice. And he goes to the Buddha, and this is after all these miracles and all this that happened before, but then he goes to the Buddha and he says, hey, Buddha, how do bodhisattvas purify their Buddha lands? And without doing a complete rehash of last week's lesson, 
the basic message that the Buddha gives is that by understanding the illusory, empty nature of all phenomena, one can purify their Buddha land through this kind of you know, direct access to equanimity, through the illusory nature of all concepts and ideas and phenomena. That's the basic teaching of that from last week. And when this teaching was given, our bodhisattva, destroyer of virtue, saw the equanimous equal nature of all dharmas and all phenomena and thereby gained this state of being that is called this kashanti, this peaceful tolerance from or due to the illusory empty nature of all phenomena, this kind of stillness that comes from that understanding of emptiness. And when that happened, boop, 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 he elevated all the way up to the height of seven palm trees as a result of this realization. And that's when the Buddha smiled. So that's where we were. And so in many ways, all of that was a big, long introduction to something so interesting, right? So then the Blessed One smiled. And it is the nature of things that when a Buddha smiles, multicolored light streams come forth from his mouth. Blue, yellow, red, white, violet, crystalline, and silver colored light. It then pervades and illuminates countless limitless worlds before then returning and disappearing into the crown of his head. Wow. At that point, the venerable Ananda arose, draped his shawl over his shoulder, knelt with his right knee on the ground and with his palms joined together, bowed to the Buddha and spoke the following verses. So, well, I'm gonna read that, but yes, this monk's name is Ananda, <laughs> is bliss. <laughs> and he's asking about why the Buddha smiles. Isn't that poetically beautiful? I think it's something that shouldn't be overlooked, <laughs> put it that way, <laughs> just happens to be Ananda. So this is Ananda's uh, uh, verse poem to the Buddha. Mastering all phenomena, you have gone beyond. O oh guide, you who have the power of a king and who are renowned in the world as an omniscient one, please explain to us, why are you smiling? Great sage, you understand the past without exception. And likewise, everything too in the future. Your knowledge of the present is also faultless. Please explain to us why you're smiling. You know the deeds of all beings, whether their minds are of the highest, middling, or lowest order. You've passed beyond notions of attachment, liberation, or even existence. Oh, captain who guides humans, please teach us. Billions of gods have already arrived, bowing with, pa with palms joined to the faultless one. With all these beings who practice the Dharma sitting here, unparalleled great sage, please speak. Your wisdom has been perfected. No confusion comes from you. You know billions of forms of conduct. So please tell us, why are you smiling? Trillions of gods have come here seeking the Dharma. There are also many monks as well in the assembly who are here wishing to hear your sad dharma, your sublime, subtle dharma. 
To venerate you, many fine instruments have been played. O oh, sage, today please swiftly eliminate all the uncertainty of all the many beings here who still harbor doubt. Okay, so that's Ananda's poem asking the Buddha why he smiles. The Blessed One then asked Venerable Ananda, Ananda, do you see that bodhisattva there, that great being, destroyer of the non-virtuous, seated there in the sky, above at a height of seven palm trees? Ananda answered, Lord, I do. Tathagata, I do. The Buddha said, Ananda, in six million, two hundred thousand countless kalpas, the bodhisattva, that great being, destroyer of the non-virtuous, will fully awaken to unsurpassed perfect enlightenment, anuttara samyak sambuddhi. And in the kalpa called free from plagues, he will appear in this great trichiliocosm, in this great 3,000, great thousand world system as a Tathagata, an Arahat, a perfectly enlightened Buddha of peace and gentleness. Ananda, to draw an analogy, the arrays of virtues and the abundance of the hearers and bodhisattvas in the Buddha realm of the Tathagata, Arhat, perfectly enlightened Buddha, peace and gentleness, it will be just like those of the Tathagata Akshobhya's realm, Abhirati, no more and no less. <clears throat> okay, that ends that section of the sutra. And so, of course, if you've come to previous Dharma doors, you already knew that the reason why the Buddha is smiling, at least in this sutra, is because he has foreseen that this bodhisattva, destroyer of the non-virtuous, the Buddha has seen that that bodhisattva will someday in how many? 6,200,000 countless kalpas, that bodhisattva will go on to become a fully awakened Tathagata Arhat Samyak Sambuddha, right? So that's why the Buddha is smiling it foretells of the uh, Vyakaranya, the prediction of enlightenment. So again, if you've been coming to Dharma doors, you saw this already coming. Somebody figures out emptiness, develops the patient tolerance for the, the not birthlessness of all phenomena, the emptiness of all phenomena, floats up to the height of seven palm trees, the Buddha smiles, light comes out of his mouth, swirls all around and goes into the top of his head and then makes a prediction. So this is a trope. It goes through all these sutras. <clears throat> but here's a funny thing. If you know that from these sutras and that you, and you know, these are again, these are very old sutras, even though they're Mahayana and all of that, Sutras like this are definitely sort of, I would suggest, contemporaneous with the arising of Buddhist iconography. <clears throat> There's always been Buddhist iconography in terms of the Dharma wheel or some basic stuff. But in terms of the general image of the Buddha, which would include a smile, and the top knot and the long earlobes and all of that, the standard Buddha image, was probably more or less being standardized around the same time as a sutra like this. So what I'm getting at is, is that there's a really subtle way then that you can interpret the Buddha's smile, which is <laughs> the Buddha's smiling 
because he's in a way predicting your future enlightenment as a fully awakened Buddha. You can look at Buddha statues and the smile as kind of capturing that. So that's kind of a beautiful, I think, way to, well, a beautiful way to combine the literature and the art and iconography into potentially um, a way of understanding the image. So, okay. Everybody good with that? Anything from the reading or the poem that didn't make any sense? <clears throat> okay, so, at, you know, this is one of those sutras where, you know, this is about Manjushri's pure land, the array of virtues of Manjushri's pure land, but we haven't even, Manjushri's nowhere in sight yet. Bo the Buddha's performing miracles over here. He's getting bodhisattvas to fly in the air over here. So we have a little ways to go, but next section. So the next section it says is with these words, with the Buddha's teaching about the prediction of the enlightenment, with these words, the Buddha departed and eventually arrived at King Ajatashatru's palace where he took the seat that had been prepared for him as the Sangha of monks arranged themselves on their respective seats. So let me tell you about King Ajatashatru really quickly, and then I'll finish reading this section. This is a really great teaching, by the way. <clears throat> so if you don't know, King Ajatashatru was a king of Magadha, a king of the region of India where the Buddha was from. If you're familiar with the Pali canon, the earlier suttas, the early Pali suttas, King Ajatashatru pops up quite a bit. There's one sutra in particular, excuse me, there's one sutra in particular that is, I would say, the most closely associated with King Ajatashatru. And it's the sutra that's called the, in Pali, the Samanapala Sutta, the fruits of the homeless life. This is a, it's a really important sutta, a very important teaching of the Buddha from the early canon. But there's a little backstory to that sutra that it's helpful to know. And it's helpful to know because if you know this backstory, you begin to understand what Ajatta Shatru symbolizes as an allegorical figure in Mahayana sutras. Here's the basic backstory. King Ajatashatru's father, the previous king, was named Bimbisara. And uh, the Buddha was friendly with King Bimbisara, <clears throat> also king friendly with his son, King Ajatashatru. But what happened was, and stories are conflicting, and I, you know who knows about history, but the stories are conflicting. There's kind of two stories. <clears throat> the basic idea, though, Prince Ajatashatru wanted to be king. And so he took his father and imprisoned him in a tower and either killed him or just waited for him to die and then declared himself the king of the region. This is important because if you read the Fruits of the Homeless Life, the Samanapala Sutta, that sutra begins with King Ajatashatru. And King Ajatashatru is having trouble sleeping. He's having trouble sleeping because he's, his, his conscience is guilty, basically, with having murdered his father and taken the throne like that. Now, as someone of India at that time, he was particularly concerned about his future rebirth. He was particularly concerned about his karma. And so the sutra or the, the sutta, it begins with the Shatru sending people out to talk to all of the forest dwellers to find out what they were teaching and basically to try to find which of them has the best way to clear up my karma. 
who's got the golden ticket to figure out how to get my karma. And so King Ajatu Shatru talked to this guy, but this guy told me to like, you know, sleep in a cave for a hundred years. I don't have a hundred years to sleep in a cave to get rid of my karma next. And then this guy told me to only, you know, eat a one seed a day for this, you know, I'm not going to eat one seed a day for a million years. So he goes to all the different teachers and then finally winds up talking to the Buddha. And the question is, it's in the title of the sutta. What are the benefits of the homeless life? That's the title of the sutra. And it's actually the, it's the question that Ajatta Shatru asks. What, what are the benefits of this, of what you're doing? It doesn't look like you're having any fun because you're running around in rags, <clears throat> you're begging for food, you're not having any sex. Like, what are the benefits of this lifestyle? So that being the case, the backstory is that Ajatta Shatru asks about being a monk for that reason. I mentioned this because last week we got an interesting Mahayana revamping of the idea of leaving home. So last week, the Bodhisattva, destroyer of virtue, basically the question was about leaving home. Like, I'm a householder Bodhisattva. What about leaving home, i.e. going and becoming a monk? And what the Buddha says is, if you understand that all phenomena are empty, that's leaving home. <laughs> that's, leaving the trans that's leaving the triple world. My point is, though, so this is kind of a new Mahayana, what are the fruits of the homeless life? But what are the fruits of this new kind of homeless life, which is the homeless life of leaving the world in that way by understanding emptiness. Okay, so just to, you know, why Ajatta Shatru, what's going on with him? <clears throat> Excuse me. So. <clears throat> so King Ajatta Shatru saw that the Buddha and the Sangha of monks were seated he personally provided them with many fine foods, drinks, and savories until they were all satisfied. Once he saw the Tathagata had finished his meal, placed his alms bowl down, and cleaned his hands, he offered the Buddha a measure of priceless fabric, whereupon he prostrated to the Buddha and to the Sangha of monks. He then took an appropriate seat sitting to one side, seated there, King Ajatta Shatru asks the Buddha, world honored one, from where do malice, anger, aggression, and hypocrisy arise? From where do ignorance, confusion, and stupidity cease. <laughs> so where do malice, anger, aggression, and hypocrisy come from? And how do we get rid of ignorance, confusion, and unknowing stupidity? <clears throat> it's a great question. It's really, really great question. The Buddha responded to King Ajatu Shatru saying, <clears throat> your majesty, malice, anger, aggression, and hypocrisy arise with the presence of self-clinging and possessiveness. When in a state of self-clinging and possessiveness, one recognizes neither positive qualities nor flaws. This is termed avidya, not knowing, ignorance. However, with respect to a person who fully understands self-clinging and possessiveness, just as they are, 
one cannot speak of knowledge or not knowledge. Your majesty, you should therefore train to avoid labeling any formations as either going or coming from anywhere. Your majesty, for one who neither goes anywhere nor comes from anywhere, all phenomena are devoid of coming and going. For one in whom there is no coming or going, there is no birth and no cessation. For one in whom there is no birth and no cessation, there is no knowing. Just as it is with knowing, so it is with not knowing. How's that? Because there is no knowledge of any phenomena. Sorry, just want to get this right. Because there is no knowledge of any phenomena that is either emancipated or not emancipated. When there is no knowledge of any phenomena that is either emancipated nor not emancipated, one is said to have wisdom. Okay, so we're going we're gonna to break that down. And I also want to share with you an alternate translation to the last part there. So <clears throat> the question's a good one. Where do anger, malice, hypocrisy, aggression, where do they come from? Self-clinging and possessiveness. That's that. So that, of course, should not come as a huge shock or surprise to anybody <laughs> coming from the Buddha, coming from the Dharma. But again, let's just kind of really pay attention. <clears throat> the idea is, is that it's the same kind of activity that's cutting two ways. One is about to this, and the other is to stuff. Possessiveness, and then what it calls self-clinging in that way. So here's an interesting one that I kind of just want you to think about. I think it's kind of what is it's getting at. So this... <clears throat> Let's start with possessiveness and then go to the self claim. So by possessiveness, we are talking about sort of clinginess, attachment, senses of ownership in that way. And of course, what I want you to kind of think about regarding the Buddha's lesson is let's take, you know, something like aggression or anger some of the examples that were given. The idea is, is that if I had something, like let's say I had my water bottle, right? And let's say, you know, I had this deep sense of ownership, possessiveness about my water bottle. And then let's say I went, you know, to the park and I put down my water bottle. And then say somebody came along and picked it up and walked away with it. <clears throat> Probably I might get a little, uh, a little upset about that, quite frankly, honestly. I'm not probably going to get aggressive because I'm kind of not that kind of person. I avoid confrontation in that way. I might get, you know, but I'm not going to be, you know, I'll be honest. I wouldn't enjoy that in that way. I would probably be a little angry. The thing to notice is, let's say that there's just a water bottle <laughs> sit like sitting over there. And like, let's say you didn't bring it to the park <laughs> and you're sitting there looking at it, right? And then imagine somebody comes up and take and walks away with it. <laughs> How do you feel about that? Are you upset about that? Are you annoyed by that? Or is that actually one of bi a billion events that take place every second that you don't care one way or the other about? It's just an event that happened. Look, a water bottle, somebody went and got it. 
But when it's your water, bo water bottle and you have that sense of ownership, now this is a whole other equation, right? So the wisdom of the Buddha is to notice how aggression and anger and those things are really bound up with possessiveness. Because when we don't have possessiveness to like those things, we tend not to get worked up and get angry about them. Isn't that interesting, right? So we notice how possessiveness can lead to <clears throat> anger and aggression and what have you. Now let's jump back to the first part, which is about self-clinging. And an interesting way to notice, an interesting way to think is to consider the disposition of ownership and possessiveness that we have to our own body. It's even in the language, we can't even really not own it linguistically, right? So it's really built into us. <clears throat> and then notice how if somebody comes and <laughs> bumps me, I might get angry, right? That same anger or aggression arising because somebody bumped me or touched me. Now, remember, what we're interested in is sort of our ability to control our own emotional state. And I say this every all of the time as a warning, uh, all of that, but I don't want to make it sound like this is about being abused. This is not about suffering abuse. It's not anything remotely close to that. But what we are talking about, though, is that time when somebody walks by you and bumps you, when that actually takes place and happens in reality, and you can get angry about that. You can give rise to aggression about that. It happens. And what we're interested in kind of noticing as practitioners is from whence that anger arises. Why? Why when the person bumps you, why would anger or aggression arise? The Buddha is suggesting it's due to this self-clinging, a kind of sense of ownership that we have even over our own bodies. And that it is that very clinging ownership that will give rise to anger and aggression, that they are in a relationship together. And so you want to get rid of anger and aggression? Work on self-clinging and work on possessiveness in that way. So everybody good with the first part of the Buddha's answer regarding anger and malice and all of that? Because that's a little easier than the second part. So let's go by, let's walk through this line by line. It is so dense. So your majesty, malice, anger, aggression, and hypocrisy arise with the presence of self-clinging and possessiveness. Check. When in a state of self-clinging and possessiveness, one recognizes neither positive qualities nor flaws. That is a little tricky. I think part of the idea is that if we, if we take, let's take, how about the person walks by and bumps me giving rise to anger due to self-clinging and possessiveness. And let's say I go, hey, watch it, jerk. So harsh speech. <laughs> so harsh speech from the anger because of the bump, right? So let's call the harsh speech a flaw. <laughs> like let's, let's call that what the Buddha is referring to as a, a flaw a fault in that way. And the idea is, is that when I'm angry and I'm yelling at the person, hey, watch it, jerk. I'm not actually observing that 
as a fault or a flaw <laughs> for actually, I probably am even like, feel like I'm some tough guy. Like I probably even think I'm cool or something, right? Because I'm telling them off, right? So that's really delusional. I'm not even, not only am I not noticing it's a fault or a flaw, I actually think it's a virtue. Okay, so that's the flaw. And when, what is it, the language again? When in a state of self-clinging and possessiveness, one recognizes neither positive qualities nor flaws. Positive qualities is a little trickier to, to think about, but I basically, the idea, many interpretations come to mind. But the idea, of course, is, is that when one is in a clouded state of anger, clinging, self-possessiveness, and all of that, virtuous qualities become harder to detect and see. Again, I actually, I guess I already kind of explained it in that idea that I'm actually mistaking calling the guy a jerk for a virtue, for like bravery or something. And so I can't even see what virtue is because virtue would not be doing that. Virtue would be, well, probably extending loving kindness to that person rather than wishing them harm. But you get my point. So when in a state of self-clinging and possessiveness, one recognizes neither positive qualities nor flaws, this is termed unknowing. The, the literal word is about being without knowledge, being without kind of wisdom in that way. That's what that is. So in a, being in a state of self-clinging and possessiveness when you can't even tell virtue from flaw. That's called not knowing or ignorance in that way. However, and this is where it gets tricky. However, in terms of a person who fully understands self-clinging and possessiveness, just as they are, one cannot speak of knowing or not knowing, of knowledge or not knowledge. So the Buddha, being a great teacher, great uh, speaker in that way, so that's the, that statement. In terms of somebody who fully understands self-clinging and possessing just as they are, you can't speak of ignorance or enlightenment, basically, of knowing and not knowing. Can't speak of it. And this should not be exactly clear right now, because the Buddha is about to do a whole syllogistic breakdown of why it is that somebody who's, in, who's aware of that, about possessiveness and self-clinging, he's about to break it down. So let's just hold on to that idea that in terms of somebody who does understand self-clinging and possessiveness, can't speak about ignorance and enlightenment. Can't speak about knowing and not knowing. Your majesty, you should therefore train to avoid labeling any formation as either going or coming from anywhere. Okay, so this is one of those situations where they are assuming you read the part from last week in terms of that the, the, the knowledge or the wisdom of this sutra is building upon itself. So what I mean is, is that the language <clears throat> of neither coming nor going is the language that was introduced last week in terms of arising and ceasing. So coming and going, arising, ceasing, birth and death, those are all the same ideas. They imply, a uh, they imply time in terms of a time before, an arising, a duration, and a going out, and then no, no more. So no existence, no existence, existence. That's sort of the general idea from last week. And what we found within the realm of emptiness, what led to the Bodhisattva's state of Kashanti, 
was an understanding that all phenomena, all dharmas in that way, neither arise nor cease. They don't come in and out of existence. And for that, in that, they can't even really be said to exist. Okay, let's, let's have a working example of that. Let's really concretize this idea, right? So, of course, my number one go-to example for neither arising nor ceasing is this. The idea, the concept, behold the fist. So there it is. So we've got a dharma. Woo, we've got a dharma. We got a fist, right? And I'm hoping that if you're looking at the screen, you're like, yep, he's holding up his fist. All right. There it is. So the question is, well, where did it come from? From whence did it arise? Better yet, oh, where did it go? Where did it come from? The idea, of course, and the reason why I like to use this example is that if you're thinking about the fist as an object, then you don't understand the nature of the fist. It's not that kind of a thing. It doesn't come into or out of existence. It either be or it not be. But there's no coming or going. It is, it's such. This is tathata. It's a good example of suchness, tathata. Look, fist. Tathata, suchness. The confusion is, whoa, where'd it go? Whoa, where is it? I can't find it. And the idea, of course, is that if you're looking for where the fist went as if it were an object, then you missed it. Fist is a concept. And as a concept, it doesn't have oomph. It doesn't have svabhava, as they would say. It doesn't have tangible existence. It has like a conceptual provisional existence. And that's why last week, the Buddha said, all phenomena, all dharmas are like illusions, like phantoms. They should be seen like that. The fist should be seen as a, like a, more of like a mirage of a fist and not a fist. So that's the basic teaching regarding suchness. And this idea that things don't arise or cease. Again, like just understanding that at a certain conceptual level is one thing. But insofar as we celebrate, celebrate our birthdays, we're not fully in touch with that idea of the suchness of all things. Meaning that our birthday is a celebration of our arising day. And of course, what's implied in our arising day is that other day. That's part of that dualistic paradigm of that. But one of the reasons why Buddhism is, in the early days at least, referred to as the teaching of the deathless is because it's a teaching that transcends the duality of birth and death via this teaching of suchness as it isness. So that's where we're headed, and that's what it was referring to here. So, your majesty, once again, you should therefore train to avoid labeling any formations as either going or coming from anywhere. So again, that's a formation. This is a formation. Got four, I've got formations all over the place here, and some of them look like they come into and out of existence. But the idea is, is that anything that you have a label for or a word, it's just that, a label or a word. So, so train 
Mag your majesty, train to avoid labeling any formations as either going or coming from anywhere. Your majesty, for one who neither goes nor comes from anywhere, all phenomena are devoid of coming and going. So the Buddha there was actually talking about like you in that sense as neither coming nor going. And then saying, one who, one who neither comes nor goes from anywhere, for that person, all phenomena are devoid of coming or going. Everybody follow on this? Okay, that <laughs> wasn't the most confident, but the I let's well let's go all the way through this, and then we'll back up if necessary. So, for one who neither goes anywhere nor comes from anywhere, all phenomena are devoid of coming and going. For one in whom there is no coming or going, there is no birth and no death. For one in whom there is no birth and no death, there is no knowing. Just as it is with knowing, so it is with unknowing, which is to say there's no unknowing either. How is all of that? How does all of that work out, you may ask? Because there is no knowledge of any phenomena that is either emancipated nor not emancipated. So that's some technical Buddhist language there. Gives me an opportunity to talk a, a little bit about this Mahayana tradition versus the earlier path, the Hinayana. So when it talks about a Dharma or a phenomena, or, you know, this could be a dharma in that sense. <laughs> this idea that there is no knowledge of anything, any dharma, any phenomena that is either emancipated nor not emancipated. So, the early Buddhist project was about taking this Dharma, the sentient subject, and moving it from a state of but bounded, bonded samsara to a state of liberation, vimoksha, emancipation, freedom. That was the very idea of kind of the early Hinayana project. Take dharmas, i.e. sentient beings, from a state of not being emancipated to a state of emancipation. This is coming along and saying, well, guess what? If you really understand this teaching of emptiness, there is nobody to be either bound or freed. <laughs> That's going to be your freedom. But that's where it's getting at. Now, this idea about there being no knowing, right? For one in whom there is no birth or cessation, there is no knowing. That's kind of a big leap. But let me just try to connect a few dots there. So the basic idea that if I can just sort of try to put this a little bit together, It's about this sort of, um, well, it's definitely about this sort of very dualistic way of thinking and seeing. And the idea here is, is that it's the way in which these ideas are bound up together. And, you know, this is a really essential teaching that I don't want to try to you know, 
I don't want to say too much about, but I don't want to say too little either. The idea is, is that these concepts are so bound up together. And what this is talking about is a certain type of that it's sort of, again, <clears throat> about things going from non-existence and then this idea that they arise and that, that they are for a while and then they cease, they go out of existence. So that idea of things arising and ceasing, it's how we think of things. In fact, it's not only how we think of all things, it's how we think of this thing. And the thing about it, it's the subtlety of this teaching. It's, it's why I'm trying to be so careful. The subtlety of this is, is that let's take the idea of arising, the idea of being, and then the idea of ceasing, uh, decaying, going out of existence. Let's take those as three, three states of being, the arising, the being, and the ceasing. What we want to begin to notice is that as soon as you have any one of those, you instantly have the other two. And they're unavoidably part of an equation. That if something is, oh, look, it's cut. Well, it must have been made. It must have come from somewhere. So there's its origin because it's, it's being. And well, if it came from somewhere and if it be, then it'll go out of existence. And again, this is a way of thinking, a way of seeing that we apply to everything, including this one. And if you begin to notice how those three ideas are interconnected, so intimately interconnected, then you can begin to notice, oh, so if I understand the constructed empty nature of something and therefore it no longer exists in that way the idea of it arising and the idea of it ceasing it no longer applies just like to my fist that doesn't come in and out of existence it just be or not be okay so or The idea of birth, well, something must have been born. So, oh, you can't have the idea of birth without a thing. And of course, if we have a thing that was born, it's gonna go out of existence. Or a death, they must have been born and they must have been. <laughs> so, these three ideas are a part of, well, first of all, they're part of the 12 link chain of causation, by the way. So I'm not just pulling this out of nowhere, but I'm focusing on the arising, the being and the ceasing and trying to notice how, if we go in with our Vajra Chedika and we go in and understand the emptiness of something, it affects the idea of its birth and the idea of its death or the idea of its arising and the idea of its ceasing. So that's the importance of this kind of teaching of emptiness and the teaching about the illusory nature of all phenomena is because we're kind of pulling the rug out from underneath existence. And that does something radical to arising and ceasing. And that does something radical to a perception of time where there's just kind of presence. And I say presence, and what I really mean is tathata or suchness, a kind of just presence, not, not happening in time in that way. So that's kind of where this is going. We're getting very close. So because there's no knowledge of any phenomena, what fist, <laughs> right? 
because there is no knowledge of any phenomena that is either emancipated or not emancipated. And what it says is one is then said to have wisdom. The Chinese is really elegant here. And I'd like to try to share with you the way the Chinese reads. It, it basically, it reads like a Zen, a beautiful Zen saying. So the, it's a uh, eight, it's an eight character um, sentence, four characters and four characters. And it says basically, if you can be like, if you can be free of the knowable, that's knowing. Yeah, it's so hard, but it's a beautiful sentence that does this kind of, you know, beautiful thing with language, but it's about being free of the knowable, but the knowable is that idea of an existent, something existing, something to, that could be emancipated or not emancipated in that way. And so if you can free yourself of the idea that there's something to know, that's knowing something. That's, so that's the kind of the beauty of that. Everybody feeling okay about all of that? Doing my best, doing my best. Speaking of which, King Ajatushatru then exclaimed to the blessed one, world honored one, it is remarkable how well the Tathagata, the Arhat, the Samyak Sambhuta teaches. Blessed one, even if I were to pass away right now, I would not have to take birth again. Because the Buddha had taught King Ajatushatru the Dharma and caused him to uphold it, the king was uplifted and delighted. The Buddha now arose and took his leave to attend the afternoon assembly for giving the gift of the Dharma. As the Buddha as the Buddha never ate after midday, he set down his alms bowl, put down his robe, then washed his feet and retired to his meditation place. Okay, so that's going to end that section, which is a really great place to stop. Any questions, comments, answers, ideas about anything that came up? So just kind of want to put one more thing quickly, since we have a couple of minutes. So funny thing happened at the end there. And, you know, it's one of those things I really would love to fully uh, tease this out. But so King Ajatushatta, right? He, he's like, wow, that's crazy, right? Very excited about the Dharma. And then he says this thing. If I were to pass away right now, I would not have to take birth again. So of course, in a, in a Buddhist context, we understand that as being a specific kind of a, a specific terminology. That's the a terminology of being an anagamin, of being a non-returner, right? So if you're familiar with that idea, in, it's part of the early Buddhist path, it's called the four fruits, the, the fruit of a stream enterer, the fruit of a once returner, the fruit of a non-returner, and finally the fruit of an arhat, the accomplishments of an arhat. So that idea of entering the stream, kind of uh, uh, signing up to be a Buddhist and kind of, you know, I'm ready, entering the stream, the idea of you only have one more rebirth. You're a, a chakra dagamin. You're only coming back one more time. You've done so good at the purification of your kleshas that you really only come back one more time. Or you could go all the way and become an anagamin, which means you're not even coming back. You're done being reborn and you will basically just live out your sort of limbo state in a heavenly abode 
finish your practice, the last traits of, of kleshas, and then you'll be an arhat. Or you could become an arhat right here, right now on earth. Those are the four stages. And a Jatushatra basically just said, wow, I've just achieved the state of a non-returner based on what you just said. Now, you could read that in the Hinayana way, and you would be like, well, how did a Jatushatru get there so fast? He didn't even have to go past the stage of a Chakra Daga man and da-da-da, and you could get all, you know. But the idea is, is that they're saying something very funny about the lesson, the lesson I was trying to give with my fist and all of that, but that idea. And it's such a subtle aspect of this relationship between the Hinayana and the Mahayana, the early path and the more later path. And as I often say, there's a way in which they are no different. And there's a way in which they are vastly different. And it's so interesting how, how that is. So the point is right here, this state of being a non-returner, it's sort of, well, what I'm getting at is, is that it's kind of talking about the same thing. Kind of. <laughs> the early path was about no self as well. It, there, there was anatta, no self, no soul, no essence in the early teaching as well. And an arhat fully understands that. An anagaman basically understands that, they say, but needs a little more work on it. A chakradagaman understands it, but needs to come back a few more times to fully understand that there's no self. A stream enterer has had a flash of understanding that there is no self, but is still kind of habitually rooted in that idea. So what I'm getting at is, is that the path, the marga, the Buddhism, has always been a path of divesting oneself of attachment and clinging to self, and has laid out an, a, a, a pattern of that. In this idea of the once returner, non returner, and arhat. This is saying the exact same thing. It's talking about the exact same idea, the exact same thing, except it, the Mahayana, my impression of the Mahayana is that Mahayana Buddhism stands up and says they're in the back, waiting patiently. And then they finally get up and say, Didn't he say there's no self? <laughs> like regarding this whole uh, once returner, non returner stuff, they're like, didn't they say there's no self? So, again, my sales pitch for the Mahayana is that it's the express route of wisdom that leads to the same place. So, on that note, that's going to do it for me.